Um, so um, to start with, um, I'm looking at Akintona, and I'll be doing this with my cohort, Olivia Cap. So um, the, cent the central um, um, the central argument that we are trying to put forward, and what we are the background of what we are trying to do is to um, look at um, the climate migrants or climate migrations, and what exactly does um, the global migration governance or the global migration regime has to do um, in in these terminologies, of course, or even looking at some of these issues. Or more importantly, focusing on the area of um, of the Pacific Island. So, um, can we go on with the next slide? So, um, so okay, I can control it from here. I think it's co-host, so we can do it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. So, um, basically, um, we can go. I, I don't want to take waste time on the content. We can go on the next one. So um, basically, we understand that um, the climate climate change poses severe multiple threats um, to human survival, and um, specifically in the Pacific Island countries. Um, despite um, contributing just um, contributing less than one percent to greenhouse and the global greenhouse gas emission, definitely they have also um, experienced a whole lot of um, climate um, impact. And this happened in this in sort of sea level rise, flooding, droughts in some area, and even oceanic acidification. And um, this is one way or the other, displacing people and, of course, also making people to voluntarily migrate both internally and um, um, and across the border. So can we get the next slide? Um, so because of this, um, we have seen a lot of statistics around the people trying to relocate, some even moving, um, trying to move within uh, um, 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 within the region. And this also uh, this is also try as much as possible to show how um, the people are, are being affected. And um, we have also seen a couple of economic and non-economic losses in the Pacific Island countries. And um, um, this is um, definitely also kind of um, showing how um, beyond affecting the GDP, we have also seen how um, the climate change issues are definitely also uh, kind of affecting land rights and all these non-economic um, non, non, non losses. But in general, um, our arguments have been, our, our, what we are trying to see and the gap that we have identified is that the global migration regime is, has not, is not really giving sort of attention um, to, to what um, to be, um, it's not giving attention to some of these climate in these e climate issues. And um, what we have seen so far is that uh, uh, um, basically in, 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 they, 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 they are, there is a kind of a clump and complacent around uh, um, how they redefine the laws and the policy frameworks that are ex the both that are existing and even trying to formulate new ones. And some of the and this is evident in the 1951 Refugee Convention. But this does not mean that some of the current ones, like the Global Climate Compact for Migration, the Sendai Framework, they are robust, right? However, what we have seen is that. Um, First, they are non-binding, and of course, most of them lack the legal bindings to protect these vulnerable persons on the move. So, um, so we have these questions. I wouldn't waste our time on this. So um, I wouldn't waste my time on this. So um, basically, we want to assess some of these issues. So basically, we have our methodology. Um, I don't know if we are here. You would like to take this part? You know, we are the methodology. <laughs> yes. It's okay. It's fine. You can do it. You can do it. No. Um. Can you hear us? Olivia, go ahead. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Well. Can you ah, see okay. I can see the screen. I'm just saying. Olivia wants to take this part, but she's unable to do. But it's okay. I will just um continue. Uh, maybe she's going to take um the other part. So basically, the research methodology we adopted is 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 a qualitative research, basically. And um, we use um, more secondary sources for this specific data, and we use journal articles and all that. So, but our model of analysis is the content content analysis. We try to put some of our dominant arguments in thematic areas and all that. And um, the working definition that we adopted for this specific um, um, for this uh, um, research is we we leverage on the Cancun adaptation um, strategy and of course also the. African shift reports that actually viewed climate mobility as movement of persons between um, within um, um, 
through displacement and of course um, land relocation and voluntary migration. So, and our 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 definition of global migration governance also is around um, um, is basically also on um, how do we, uh, we we also try to look at this from the from the view of um, the existing structures both regional and global. So. Um, INGO society. So these are these are our arguments. Uh, these are our own focus of what we call as the global migration governance. Next slide, please. So um, the theoretical framework we actually adopt for this is called the humanization theory because we feel that either you call it um, either you call it uh, climate migrants or climate uh, or climate refugee, basically. Uh, um, so we, we feel that in, 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 in irrespective of what we call it, we think that the people should be. At the center of every global migration policy, and we've also feel and this framework tells that if you want to do that, it's important that you hear the human story. So, why the quantitative data are also important, we must start looking at the humans, which is the qualitative data aspect of it. And this framework presents a couple of eight philosophical dimensions, which I wouldn't um, take much time on that. But specifically, this theory says that humanization, humanizing is. A central part of should be a central part of global migration governance and of course its policy. Next slide, please. Um, Olivia, are you here? Um, she 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 wants to take this part. Um, I don't know if she's allowed to do that. Yeah, sorry, just because we didn't uh, I, when I put co-host. Yeah, exactly, my co host. Then you will have access. Ah, okay, okay. I think you have access. So now. You, you both have access now. Okay. okay. Olivia, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Well, yeah, so to make this short, in our presentation, we're explaining different gaps and also the frameworks that we're using. So, uh, for the first one, it's in 1951. And one of the uh, gaps that we found is that the convention does not have any legal uh, definition. Sorry, Olivia, yeah. we, we yeah. don't hear you well. Okay. At all. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Um, yeah, it should be better. It should be better. Yeah, this is better. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for letting me know. So basically, I'll be taking over the global migration gaps in frameworks. So the first um, framework is the 1951. Geneva Convention, and one of the gaps we found is that the convention does not have any legal definitions of what a climate refugee and what a climate is. Um, the next framework we have is the framework for resilience development in the Pacific. So the framework does not take into account the vulnerabilities that climate has when it comes to people affected by climate change. And then the last framework is the um, global order for safe and early migration. And the framework does not mention the need for safe migration pathways for people impacted by the climate. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Um, thank you so much. Um, so um, thank you, Olivia, for that. So basically, um, our argument and what we try to do is after looking at all these um, the gaps, we believe that a, um, our argument would be that first, I, we think that uh, it's important to start humanizing the policy response to climate mobility issue in the Pacific Island. And we think that people need to be at the center, like the humanizing, humanizing, humanization um, theory rightly put it. So we need, to, we need people need to start being at the center of uh, our migration policies. But also, like we said, we need to start humanizing quantitative data. That is, we need to start um, making it, uh, um, we need to start talking about qualitative data and putting human stories into our numbers. We also think that we need to start forging a robust partnership across all, all spectrums. And this means that we need to start um, working with frontline communities, especially people that are directly affected. And definitely, we also, um, we also try to talk about um, reviewing existing migration policies that is some of the existing ones need to be reviewed and this it needs to start looking at how do we put people at the center but not just on paper but of course in terms of um in terms of um, um implementation and finally we talked about um we need a comprehensive climate and migration policy so if we are looking at climate mobility we can't just stick to migration alone we need to start including um climate expert environmental expert into this conversation and that is the way we we think that some of these, uh, we can start having robust policy response. And so in the end, either we call it climate migrant or climate migration, looking 
removing the legal context of it, I think it is important that the people should be at the center. And that's our argument and our conclusion to this part. Thank you.